in this video I'm going to explain how you can reharmonize the hymn tune Amazing Grace. I'm going to start by playing my reharmonized arrangement and then I'm going to go back and use the lead sheet on the left hand side which has a very basic arrangement just using the chords 1, 4 and 5 and explain step by step each of the uh, chord substitutions that I've used. So this is my reharmonized arrangement. Okay, so as I said, the lead sheet on the left hand side just has three chords in it, chords one, four and five. Um, if you're not familiar with the Roman numerals that I'm using, uh, this is uh, a, a way of chord notation that's used in traditional harmony. Uh, it's a really good way of uh, using chord because it makes you think of the chords in relation to the key. We're in the key of F major and we can build a series of diatonic chords on each note of the uh, F major scale by adding a note, a third and a fifth above that note. All of those notes come from the F major scale. And we then label them with uh, Roman numerals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've drawn circles around three of the chords, chords one, four and five. And you notice that they are in uppercase Roman numerals. That's because they are major chords. F major, B flat major, and C major. Chords two, three, and six are in lowercase, G minor, A minor, and D minor. So uppercase is major, lowercase is minor. Chord seven has a little circle after it, that's because it's a diminished chord. So I'm going to go back now to the lead sheet and I'm just going to play through that playing single melody notes in the right hand and the chords one, four and five in the left hand in root position. It's such a great hymn that even played like that, I still quite like it actually. Um, you can improve on that quite considerably without doing any chord substitutions, simply by revoicing the chords. That means that you rearrange the notes of the chord. So instead of having them in a little group like that, in the left hand, we're going to spread the notes of the chord out between the melody note at the top and the bass note at the bottom. So the first chord we get is chord one, F major. So we play the F in the melody. If it's an F major chord, you play F down in the bass. So whatever the name of the chord, that's going to be also the bass note, unless the chord is inverted. What that means is you can play a chord in root position where the root note, that's the, the note that the chord's built on and named after, is down in the bass this case F, if you play it in first inversion, the third of the chord, A, is in the bass, and the fifth of the chord, C, is in the bass. Okay, now, the way you space the notes is really important. You can do it like this. We play melody note, bass note. We've got two notes left now, A and C, to fill in. I'm gonna put the A there and the C there. Those notes are fairly evenly spaced. Um, you can use evenly spaced notes like that. We call that a, an open voicing. If anything, the spaces are better if they get bigger towards the bottom. Um, or you can use them like this, a kind of closed position. 
where we've got three notes at the top and then a big space to the bottom. What you must avoid is this kind of voicing. You've got three notes all huddled together down at the bottom, then a big space and two notes at the top. That sounds awful, it sounds really muddy. So spread the voices out or have a cluster at the top, but not at the bottom. One particular thing to avoid is having the third near the bass note. So whatever the third of the chord, bring it up closer to the melody, unless, of course, it's in first inversion, and then that means that that uh, note is the bass note. So let's just play the first couple of phrases. You notice there I had the A, the third of the chord there rather than there. When I go into the <coughs> B flat chord, I've got the third of the chord D up there rather than there. And when I go to the C chord, the third of the chord E is up there rather than down there. And already this is beginning to sound better. Okay, we're now going to go on to the first chord substitution that I've used. So uh, on bar two, instead of playing the F chord again, chord one, I'm going to play chord three, which is A minor. And also I'm going to make it a sevens chord by adding the G on. Let's try that. Now that's already improved things. Um, why have I chosen that particular chord? Well, if you look at an A minor triad, as the notes A, C and E, two of those notes, A and C, are also in the F chord. We could have chosen a different chord, could have had chord six, D minor, for the same reason, because that has two notes, in this case, F and A, that are also in the F major chord. So that's, that's an important little principle to remember now, I'd, I'd make a note of that, that you can often substitute chord one with either chord three or chord six. Always depends on the context of it and the best guide as to whether it works or not is always your ear. In this case, I like it very much because it leads up to chord four by a semitone in the bass. A rises a semitone, and that is always a strong progression uh, when, when the bass note rises up a semitone to the next chord. Okay, um, let's look at the, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is, it's not really a substitution this, I am simply going to add a ninth onto chord four at the end of the first line and chord one at the beginning of the second line. Um, these are not to be confused with major ninth chords. A B flat major nine chord would contain the major sevenths. When you say add nine, you just mean the triad, the three notes, plus the ninth, but without the major seven. And it's usually put in the middle like that, next to the third, or in the F chord just there. So let's listen to that. Can you hear that? That just gives it a little bit of colour. Quite a contemporary sound as well. Okay, we're now going to introduce what we call a secondary dominant chord. A dominant chord is chord five. And what we're going to do is look at the chord five at the end of the second line so that is a C major chord, chord five in the key of F major. However, just for a moment, we're going to say, right, don't think of it as being chord five in the key of F major. Think of it as being chord one in the key of C major. Now, if we're thinking of that as chord one, we can precede that with chord five from the key of C major. So let's just look at that. Those are the triads, the diatonic triads in the key of C major. Chord five is G major. 
So let's go back and try playing that. I'm going to make it G7 by adding the F on it. See what that sounds like. tension it kind of lifts it which is then resolved now we can take any major or minor chord in a piece and treat it as a new tonic so think of it as being the first note of a, that key and precede it with chord five from that key now, of course, it's got to work with the melody note. In this case, it works perfectly because the melody note A is the ninth of G7. So it adds even more color to it. The G is the root, so it fits perfectly. Okay, I'm now going to add um, an inversion. The uh, chord 5 of 5 that I've just put in on the G at the end of that bar I'm going to play that chord in first inversion by moving the root up to the third 5B means that it's in first inversion Roman numeral on its own or sometimes people put a, a letter A after it means root position, the B means first inversion, third in the bass, C means second inversion, D is if you have a seventh chord and it's in third inversion, that would be the seventh in the bass. So five, seven, five, B, and once again, we've got that nice semitone rising to the root of the following chord, which is always very strong. Okay, now I'm going to look at the chord just before the new five of five. And if you look, I've put a box around, uh, I've got F and then a number six and C number two. What I mean by that is if we extend this logic of treating the C chord at the end of the line, not as chord five in the key of F, but as chord one in the key of C, We've said, OK, in that case, we can precede it with chord five from the key of C. And if you extend that logic further backwards, you can say, right, we can also precede the five chord with chord two in the key of C. The chord progression two, five, one is the number one progression that you really just need to know. In the key of C, that would be D minor, G, C, key of F, that would be G minor, C, M. So when we're going to use the D minor chord. So why have I put F and 6 and C as 2? Well, at that point in time, you can think, well, I'm still in F major there and I'm using chord 6, which is D minor. Or you could think, well, I'm on the way into C major, so I can think of that chord now as chord two. It's a kind of dual function at that point. And whenever you're going into a, a different key, if you can find a chord that is in both keys and use it um, to precede the dominant, then it will always give you a smooth kind of transition. So I'm gonna play all of that so far now. to put a five chord at uh, in bar five uh, on the C at the end of that bar and I'm going to play it in first inversion so chord five in the key of F is C major first inversion means that the note E the third of the chord will be in the bass so if I play bar five we're now getting So the 
the chord five there leads very smoothly to chord six. Chord five followed by chord six is always a strong progression. It's actually one of the cadences. Um, it's called an interrupted cadence. And if you play it with the five in first inversion, you get this lovely descending bass line. So all the time we're using substitutions and inversions and trying to create a bass line that is melodic. Um, rather than when we just have the chords one, four and five, you, you get this kind of bass line. When we start using substitutions and inversions, we, we suddenly create a more melodic bass line. If I just play the melody and the bass notes now for what we've done so far, it sounds like a... So you can hear that the, the bass line has a melody of its own. It's also at that particular place, it's strong because the bass line is going down while the melody is going up. Contrary motion between parts, particularly between the melody and the bass, is always strong. Okay, now at the end of the second line, I've drawn a circle around the five chord and also the five chord which is tied onto bar nine uh, and I put a number four in front of the, I'm uh, sorry, after the five and then a number three when we get to bar nine. Now that means that we're going to use what we call a suspension. I've done another video about the use of suspensions and I'll put the link in the description below. A suspension is a non-chord note, it doesn't belong to the chord. It's called a suspension because in traditional harmony, it would always be prepared in the chord before that. In other words, it would be played in the chord before it as a chord note. And instead of going on to the chord note that you expect it to go on to in the five chord, um, it's suspended, it's kept on, and then it resolves uh, to the Chord third, sorry, the suspension, the suspended fourth resolves to the third in the next bar. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Um, if I play the second line, in that chord we have the note F, which belongs to the G7 chord. Now you expect it in the C chord to go to the E. However, we're going to suspend it, keep it there. And then in bar nine, resolve it to the third. So it's a fourth because it's four letter names above C, C, D, E, F, and it resolves to the third. If I put the sevens in, sounds a bit more colorful. And also you can add the ninth to it. And then the ninth can go down to the root. So you've got a little movement in thirds there. So again, starting from the second line. What I did just there was Instead of playing the D and the F like that, I just circled around the E and then moved them down a step. And again, that just creates a bit more movement. Okay, I've got another substitute here. This is on the bottom line, the next to the last bar. Um, do you remember at the beginning when I said we chose the chord three for the second bar that we could have used chord six instead of one? Well, that's what I'm doing here. Bottom line. Remember, D minor has two notes in common with F, so it, it works as a suitable substitution. As with all substitutions, it's got to work with the melody. 
and in this case the melody note A is the fifth of the D minor chord so there's no problem with it at all. Okay now sticking with the chord that we've just used the chord six in place of chord one on the next to the last bar we're going to treat that as a new tonic now we're going to think of that D minor chord not as chord six in the key of F but we're going to think of it as chord one in the key of D minor and therefore it follows that we can precede that with chord five from the key of D minor chord five in the key of D minor is A major we make it the seventh we add the note G so we're going to play an A7 at the end of the bar before the D minor chord and I'm also going to invert it, put it in first inversion, so that third of the A minor chord, C sharp, rises a semitone to the root of the D minor chord, like this. Also, I've not written it in, but I think I play a, a, a ninth in there, an added ninth. Just gives that little bit of colour on the minor chord. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, I've now put another um, secondary dominant chord in on the next to the last bar. So we've just done, and we're heading to chord four. I've said, right, let's treat chord four as a new tonic. Let's proceed it with its dominant. So we're looking at a B flat major chord. The dominant chord in the key of B flat is F major. And again, we're going to make it F7. Dominant chords mostly want the seventh included. And again, I'm going to put it in first inversion with a third of the chord A in the bass so that it leads like that up a semitone to the B flat chord. So that bottom line now is and again I've put the added ninth in there on chord four. Okay um Uh, oh yeah, right, so we've got to chord four, this is the last bar on the third line down, and then I've put, this is not a secondary dominant now, um, it's the dominant seventh in the key of F that we're in, so it's a C7, so it's, it's preceding chord one on bar 13 with its dominant, but it's, it's not a secondary dominant because we're in that key. So C7, and again, first inversion, so that in the bass. You might have noticed, by the way, that some of these dominant seventh chords, I'm not actually playing the root. For instance, just then, there's no C there. Now, you could argue that, strictly speaking, that chord then is not a C7. It's an E minor 7 with a flattened fifth, or you can call it an E half diminished chord. However, it's much better to think of it as a C7 chord, but without the root. It functions in exactly the same way and takes you back to the tonic. Okay, so we're on the bottom line now. And uh, I've put, on the second bar of the bottom line, I've put, um, a couple of options I've put chord four so we could go to there if we did that then it would be a good idea to proceed it with chord 1b because you've got that semitone approach in the bass the other option is for instead of the chord one in bar 14 using chord six the D minor chord again and in that case, it's a good idea to precede it once again with the passing 5B going down. Now, after 
that we're putting five of five again so remember chord five is c major its chord five is g7 and uh, if we did uh, we're going back to the chord six if we opted for all that we could go six then go down a step in the bass to six seven d and then that leads nicely to the five seven b now when we get to the five instead of playing five we're playing one c that's chord one in second inversion f chord with c in the bass when you play that at a cadential point one c five one it feels really like a dominant chord with two suspensions a ninth and a fourth which then resolve so that the chord that comes before it is a chord that would normally approach the dominant in that key so once again the two options on that bottom line uh, from bar 13 is 1b going to 4 and then 5 7 b of 5 1 c 5 1 the other option is 1 5b 6 6 7d 5 7b and then back 1c 5 1 okay um on the last couple of bars you notice i've put a, a four in you could play it there um it's uh, actually I, that should be 4c because we're keeping the F in the bass and it's a kind of Amen sound. Um, I think in the arrangement I actually played it like this. So I played the uh, B flat and the D resolving to the A and the C and then I just went down another step to the G and the B flat and then back up those added ninths by the way you can play them just like that or you can play them as a crush note or if you want a bluesy sound to it you can approach the third of the F chord from the G the added ninth then the G sharp then the A so that last bit could have Um, I did a little run just before that um, so all I did there was play C to F in the F chord and then I played the added ninth together with the fifth going up to the third then to the root and then back to the fifth so thing that I did in the arrangement that I've not actually written on this lead sheet and it's going back to chord uh, to bar one um, when I go from one up to three seven and then did this now I didn't write that in because um, at that stage that that would look a little bit complicated what I've done there is played three, seven, A minus seven, and then at the end of the bar, I've changed it to A seven. Now, A seven is the dominant chord in the key of D minor, but a dominant chord often rises um, either a semitone or a tone um, to chord six. And chord six in the key of D minor is B flat. So that works. So not only can you precede uh, a, a new tonic chord 
uh, from its dominant, but you can precede it from either a semitone or a tone below. And again, it's got to work with the melody. In this case, it worked perfectly because the G is the seventh of A7. I also just did a little passing thing motion the E in the right hand goes up to the F the left hand goes to the F and at that point that is then an F major chord in first inversion and then we have the seventh there the fifth of uh, so we're now on the A7 so we've got three chords in there we've got a minus 7, F in first inversion, A7. Hope you found that useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I've not talked about more advanced uh, reharmonization techniques, such as the use of um, flat and fifth or tritone substitutions and the use of upper structure triads on dominant chords and diminished seventh passing chords and things like that and um, I'm going to save those for a, for a later video when I do a, a more advanced jazz type reharmonization. Thank you for watching.